Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Logan Lecture featuring Tenzing Rigdal. I'm Jennifer McClosey, manager of Contemporary Alliance, which is a support group of the Denver Art Museum. Contemporary Alliance presents the Logan Lectures with the generous support of Vicki and Kent Logan. Tonight, we have a co-sponsor, and I'm thrilled to let you know that the UCD College of Arts and Media is celebrating 20 years so thank you for your generous sponsorship and welcome to the students, staff, faculty, and administrators in the audience. Bravo. The museum joins UCD in honoring Emmy Bunker this evening for her support of Tenzing's exhibition at Emanuel Gallery. Just a show note, as we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that this evening is being recorded and we will have a brief Q&A toward the end. If you have a question, please wait until a microphone is passed to you. And now I'd like to give over the podium to Dr. Young Wong for a brief introduction of Tenzing Rigdal and Sarah Magnata. Dr. Wong is an assistant professor of art history in the College of Arts and Media at UC Denver, where she teaches a wide range of classes on Asian, modern, and contemporary art. Her research focuses on the role of Chinese art in establishing post-war global modernism. She is currently working on a book that examines a mid-20th century ink collective through the lens of Chinese nationalism, Cold War politics, and neo-traditionalism. Her research has been supported by Fulbright, the American Oriental Society, and PEO International. Her forthcoming article uh, for Arts Margin is titled Envisioning the Third World, Modern Art and Diplomacy in Maoist China. Welcome, Yang Wang. Thank you, Jennifer, for that generous introduction and to the DAM Contemporary Alliance for tonight's collaboration. On behalf of CU Denver College of Arts and Media, I echo Jennifer's gratitude to the Logans, Emmy Bunker, and the Bunker family. In addition, I would like to thank the following individuals and organizations for supporting tonight's event and the upcoming exhibit at CU Denver. Fabio Rossi of Rossi and Rossi in London and Hong Kong the McDonnell Automotive Group of Littleton, Colorado, Sharifa and Adam Moore, Sammy Lee of Collective SMLK, Colleen Fanny, and the CU Denver Asian American Student Services. As Jennifer mentioned, this year we are celebrating the 20th anniversary of the College of Arts and Media, and we are proud and honored to bring back to Denver one of our most accomplished alumni, Tenzing Rigdal, the future artist of tonight's event, which will take the format of a conversation. It is my honor to introduce the two speakers of tonight's event. I will first introduce our moderator and the guest curator of the upcoming exhibit at the Emanuel Art Gallery, Dr. Sarah Magnata. Dr. Magnata received her PhD in art history from The Ohio State University, where we were classmates, and where she trained to become a specialist in Tibetan and South Asian art. She has been an affiliate faculty member at the University of Denver since 2010. Her courses include Asian and Tibetan art history, sacred spaces, politics and art, Buddhist art, and a summer travel course to New York City that examines contemporary displays of contemporary of Tibetan art. She is currently on the museum board of the College Art Association. Dr. Magneta was a former interpretive specialist of Asian art right here at the Denver Art Museum, where she worked on exhibits such as Samurai, Ganesha, and Linking Asia for which she wrote a catalog essay and several entry, several ca uh, object entries. Sarah, Sarah is now um, consulting on upcoming exhibits throughout Denver, including one with contemporary Cambodian artist, Leon Sakon at the McNichols Center. She is publishing a forthcoming article titled, Common Ground, Place and Identity in Contemporary Tibetan Art in the Journal of the British Association for South Asian Studies. In conversation with Dr. Magneta tonight will be our guest artist, Tenzin Rigdal. 
Rigdal is a contemporary Tibetan artist whose work ranges from painting, sculpture, drawing, and collage to digital video installation, performance art, and site-specific works. His paintings are the products of collective influences and the interpretation of age-old traditions. They're influenced by philosophy, often capturing the ongoing issues of human conflicts and have strong political undertones. Born in 1982 in Kathmandu, Nepal, Rigdal and his family were granted political asylum in the United States in 2002, and they settled right here in Colorado. Rigdal has studied Tibetan sand painting, butter sculpture, and Buddhist philosophy in Nepal. In 2005, he earned a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Painting and Drawing and a Bachelor of Arts in Art History from the University of Colorado, Denver. Rigdal is also an accomplished poet, having published several collections of his poetry. He has widely exhibited internationally, and his artworks are included in public and private collections around the world. In 2014, Rigdal became one of only two contemporary Tibetan artists to be included in the ex exhibition Tibet and India, New Beginnings at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. His work, Pin Drop Silence, 11-headed Avalokiteshvara, was also the first work by a contemporary Tibetan artist to be acquired by the Met. Although Rigdal is no longer based in Denver, we couldn't be prouder of his accomplishments. We are excited to welcome him back to Colorado to participate in tonight's event and also hold his first solo exhibition in the United States at CU Denver's Emanuel Art Gallery. So without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Magneta and Rigdal. It's just me first, so um, thank you so much, everyone, for coming, and thank you, Young, for that introduction. Let me get this going. Uh, I've known Young for a while now, and I can say the Denver art community is very lucky, uh, uh, very lucky to have her, as are her students and her peers at CU Denver. So I'll keep this slide up because I also need a moment for a few thank yous uh, before we get started to the Contemporary Alliance and Becky Hart for inviting Tenzing Rigdal to this series and to Jennifer McClosey for her work in making it happen and to the artist himself. So thank you Rigdal for bringing your work back to Denver for all of us to enjoy. An enormous thank you goes to Emmy and Lambert Bunker. Uh, I know that we've already said this, but I have to say it again because they've been incredible supporters uh, of both Rigdal and myself over the years. And so I'm so thrilled to have this evening with them. Please do plan on coming March 21st uh, from six to nine is the opening of the exhibition. We will have this beautiful catalog for sale at the exhibition. Uh, and if you come opening night, maybe you can get the artist to sign a copy. So he will be there. I want to give a short introduction to some of Rigdal's work, and this will be about 10 minutes. Then we can look forward to hearing from the artist himself. So he's agreed to answer my questions about these works, as well as questions we received in advance from students at CU Denver, and then from anyone in the audience who might have a question. So speaking of CU Denver, as Young mentioned, Rigdal was a student right here at CU in the early 2000s, and this is a work that was exhibited in the Emanuel Art Gallery for a student exhibition at the time. It now resides with the collector in New York City, but I think you can see, even in this very early work, uh, Rigdal's ability to create a visually stunning composition. So the title of this work is Brief History of uh, Tibet, but it is 10 feet across. It is just a really... Uh, um, monumental work. So for those of you familiar with Buddhist iconography, you can see how Rigdal takes some of these traditional forms like the mandala or like these Buddhist deities and he manipulates those forms in new ways and brings new meanings to those forms. Uh, and he's creating new arrangements in the painting that we don't find in traditional Tibetan art. So as Young mentioned, Rigdal was the first contemporary Tibetan artist to have work collected by the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and that is this work. The Met has long collected traditional Tibetan works, so it was an important milestone for the museum to recognize that Tibetan art is also a contemporary movement. And the artists, especially many working in exile, while sometimes incorporating traditional elements, have moved beyond those elements, as you see here. So again, those of you familiar with Buddhist art will recognize the bodhisattva named Avalokiteshvara, though Rigdal's version of Avalokiteshvara is clearly not created for traditional purposes. The image appears fractured, the facial features are missing, and parts of the background, which traditionally might have been landscape influenced by Chinese painting, 
is replaced with the Sungdu, which is a collection of mantras that addro uh, address devotional practice. The Met curator, Kurt Barrett, links this idea of using these mantras to the Ye Dharma. The Ye Dharma is an inscription on many Buddhist works, and we have several here at the dam with this inscription. Uh, the stone sculptures you'll oftentimes see with the Ye Dharma written above the Buddha's head. The Ye Dharma charges the devotional objects with the presence of the Buddha. So I think Kurt's take on this is an interesting one, and I'm interested in hearing what Rigdal thinks of that reading uh, when we speak with him. So this work is currently on display uh, at the Met. This was from a few weeks ago. So I hope you're okay with me putting this in here, Rigdal. Uh, if you happen to be in New York City, then you will find this up now. To take a step back for a minute, I want to explain how I came to know and love Rigdal's work. So my background is actually in traditional Tibetan art and portraiture in particular, so think Dalai Lama images. Um, but when I transitioned over to researching contemporary artists about five years ago, I was really struck by Rigdal's ability to create works that connect landscape rather than portraiture with identity. In 2000, uh, well, so I began looking at works that showcased elements of landscape. So in 2015 and 16, Rigdal completed three paintings with the word landscape in the title. Two of these, Arrested Landscape 1 and 2, and by the way, this is in the exhibition, uh, include recognizable elements such as mountains and clouds, but have subtle references to culturally specific symbols. The lines on Rigdal's paintings evoke the guidelines and grid lines used as a first step in traditional Buddhist image creation. But they're also responses to the traditional format. Rigdal has noted he's extremely interested in Jacques Derrida's ideas of deconstruction, and the artist incorporates some of these more philosophical ideas into his work. He describes a process of using a traditional Buddhist iconometry drawn as custom dictates, and then as he says, he erases it and exploits it. These spaces remain colorless and give further credence to the title, Arrested Landscape, since they appear to suggest on one level that the painting has been halted in its production. The third Rigdal painting, titled Landscape, uses the more recognizable Buddha figure in a reclining posture as the horizontal landscape element crossing three canvases. The reclining Buddha is popular in many parts of Asia and usually signifies the death of the historic Buddha. This pose is not as prominent in Tibetan art as a central image, uh, perhaps due to its association with death, there's a very inauspicious quality to it. Diagonal lines connect the traditional Chinese-influenced clouds at the top to the figure at the bottom. Their rigidity evokes a sense of rain, or at least an ominous feeling. And I think that ominous quality is further emphasized with the blank face of the Buddha as he reclines on this sharp red background uh, extending across three canvases, a reference to the three historical Tibetan regions of Utsang, Amdo, and Kham. The landscape is here further established and connected to a Tibetan identity with the use of the body of the Buddha. The figural representations of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, even when used in contemporary and unexpected ways, signify a connection to Tibetan identity, or at least are received that way by the viewer conditioned to associate Tibetan with Buddhist. Uh, Rigdal's paintings often include figural Buddhist imagery and references. However, his 2011 installation project in India was far more reliant on the issue of place and land as it relates to identity. The land in the work was from Tibet, but the installation itself was located in India. Rigdal's uh, team secretly brought over 20,000 kilograms of dirt from Tibet into India. The project is titled Our Land, Our People, and it c connected with an audience largely consisting of the Tibetan exile community of Dharamshala. So I want to show a three-minute trailer for a film uh, documentary that uh, was produced about this project, and it is available now on iTunes, but this three-minute trailer, I think, will give you a sense of just how difficult this project was. <laughs>
I'm working on the so-called site-specific art installation. I never went through like uh, really planning for it, but then somehow I got this idea, inspiration from my father. The sculpture itself is like a stage on which I lay the uh, soil that's from Tibet, and then I would have a request the participant or the audience to really. Uh, walk on it and then just uh, exhibit their feelings and express their feelings and uh, so that that's that's the uh, project Okay, <laughs> So that is on iTunes now, so you can watch that whole film. Okay, so, and then of course I want to show the highlight of the Emanuel Art Gallery exhibition, which is My World is in Your Blind Spot. These are five panels created of silk and manuscript pages. Each panel is six by six feet, so truly an incredible work of art to behold, uh, and will be shown at the gallery for the first time in the United States. These imposing Buddha silhouettes greet the viewer in their recognizable cross-legged seated positions, a posture often associated with meditation and peace, and with a stunning visual effect enhanced by the use of silks and fire imagery. The work brings vivid colors and interesting patterns to the eye, but the fires seemingly emerging from the bodies of the Buddhas are also direct acknowledgments of the 155 Tibetans who have self-immolated, that is, set themselves on fire since February 27, 2009. And yet the Buddhas seem peaceful, even welcoming in their balanced postures. Their calming presence is perfectly harmonized by an artist well-versed in representing both destruction and construction. The contradictions on display in this exhibition are meant to challenge the viewer. They are simultaneously safe and subversive, beautiful to look at, devastating to comprehend. They are emblematic of the ambitious imagery created by Tenzing Rigdal. So we will keep these works up and others on the screen, uh, rotating through some of these so you can have a chance to see more of his work as we discuss them. But now, please welcome to the stage artist Tenzing Rigdal. Mics on? 
Yes. Hello. Hello. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 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 So let's start with the works we were just looking at, um, and the namesake of the upcoming exhibition, "My World Is in Your Blind Spot." Can you tell us more about why you created these, and why, in particular, the self-immolations have become such an important part of your work? Um, first, thank you, everyone. And I also met my two professor, Professor Donsky and Vivin George. Thank you for coming. <laughs> and you guys are going to have to be a little loud. Oh, OK. Can, so we, can we turn the mics up? Yeah. Is that, is that OK? Can you hear? Hear me? OK. OK. So yeah, thank you, uh, everyone, for coming here. And um, <coughs> I think after I left Colorado, I, I think the identity of me being a Tibetan started growing a little bit more. And because when, it was, when I was in school, I was only studying, and uh, studying actually more of Western history, Western art, Western philosophy. And then, um, then with Tibet, especially with the images of those, the Tibet, there were lots of uh, self immolation happening. And, uh, and then I think I got, uh, all my work started having a lot to do with fire. And even in poetry, uh, so even the fire, like even when you're lighting a cigarette, you know, it, it, it was a different, uh, it was changing its meaning. And um, so at that time, uh, for the, I think uh, in one of the, I forgot, Moscow Biennale maybe, at that time they wanted to have a, 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 a they gave me a big wall. So I thought it would be best to have uh, uh, something to do with Tibetan self immolation So it, this is about 30 feet by 6 feet, I believe. So that's the piece I made. Can you talk a bit more about the materials? So the manuscript pages in the background and what that oh. might say, and, and what Kurt said about uh, linking it to the like, Dharma, perhaps. Yeah, for me it was very. Uh, um, I think any kind of work I'm trying to see how, how can I, have a personal meaning, and at the same time also have, uh, have its own universal meaning too, where. Uh, I'm not really uh, dictating the piece. Yeah. But from a personal point of view, all the uh, background uh, scriptures, because in Tibet, my father's family used to make ink. And uh, nothing fancy factory, but very traditional way of uh, having collecting those powdered ink, yeah. which uh, they sell it to monasteries and all, and then they print scripture out of it. And what I do is, most of the traditional uh, Tibetan art where uh, the use of landscape <coughs> came in the like 15th century. And I removed the landscape. And the Chinese influenced yeah. landscape. So yeah. I removed mm -hmm. the landscape and I said, what if I add the scripture there, mm -hmm. which from my point of view is my father, family, and all this there. But at the same time, it's also the script that all three provinces of Tibetan, even though they have a different dialect, they all understand this script, the Uchen script. So that is more of a play. And also I also say, OK, then how about I change the way of depicting the uh, Buddha itself? Then I'm removing some element of Nepalese influence. Yeah. Because the Thangka, traditional Thangka painting itself has come out of uh, influence from many countries, like Nepal, India, and China, when they all <laughs> all these influences were re reinterpreted. It became Thangka painting. Mm. And so I'm removing a little bit of Indian influence, a little bit of Nepalese influence, a little bit of Chinese influence. Then I'm saying, maybe now what we have is so-called Tibetan. So it's more mm. like this play. And, um, and also, uh, slowly, I'm beginning to uh, use the, the Buddha's image as a stage. And then slowly I'm um, putting my own uh, interpretation of what's happening now, like mm -hmm. self-immolation, then 
the fire element. And also the fire, uh, I didn't want uh, very restless. So I took thousands of pictures of the fire. They were all taken indoor, inside the room. And, uh, and then actually they were all pieced together. Uh, like uh, each fire is this. So I just stick them together and try to see if I can create uh, some form of, uh, it's a disorder, but a bit controlled disorder. Um, I recall you once saying something about a curator asking you uh, to not make something too political, not make your art so f for an exhibition. Can you expand on that? And why is that word political? Um, yeah, I think there are a few words I, I'm still struggling. One is art, <laughs> and uh, one is, yeah, politics, this new word that I, when I was in school, that was never a problem. But then, slowly, the very word changes its meaning, who's using it. I realize that sometimes it means uh, about the subject matter. Mm. Sometimes it simply means uh, uh, a work that you can't show. And, um, but for me, it's always been, I always say my work is about trying to be honest. So it's not even about being truthful. So. <coughs> Um, what I hear about uh, my family's story, my country's story, these are all uh, my experience. So it's never a politics. Mm. And, um, but then uh, I think uh, when the personal story is lost, then I think it might, people might look at it as you're making a statement. But I'm not making a statement. I'm just telling you what I feel. So it's not even... So, so over there, he was saying, oh, wonderful, uh, love your work, let's have a show together. But uh, he said, then let's not make too many poll I said, I don't know, what do you mean by that? Mm. And um, are you saying make anything which, uh, which uh, you have no experience about? Or, so I asked that way. And then I think he also realized, okay, we two have different meaning of politics. Okay. So, um, so for me, uh, <coughs> I don't know what is politics. Right, it's a tough one. <laughs> um, the next question is from a CU Denver student mm. who asks, have you faced censor censorship of your work? Where and how did you deal with it, if so? Yeah, I think, um, I think two kinds of censorship. One is I've noticed sometimes I myself is a person, the first person who's working on censorship, what subject to pick, what not to pick. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm, I'm beginning to believe that the real uh, beginning of censorship is the very movement when you're trying to look at a subject matter. At that very point, I try to make sure that I'm just an observer. I'm not an interpreter. Mm -hmm. So in that way, um, I allow the subject matter to really grow within me. And then I think I arrive at a point where, um, where whatever other people tell me what can you can show or not, I look at it more as that person's uh, uh, view about what is censorship, not right. really about me. So my censorship really begins at when I look at subject matter. Yeah. So in that way, I think. and. Um, <coughs> Sorry, and then I think, um, um, and I yeah, go through lots of censorship <laughs> from outside more now, right. which is also uh, I think is very interesting. Uh, it uh, it again comes back to me to think about uh, how the interaction is happening. So yeah, lots of films have been stopped. Many of the shows has been uh, had uh, suffered that. Yeah, and uh, sometimes Tibetan themselves censor me, sometimes uh, uh, China. So it's a, uh, yeah, I, from my point, I, not, I try not to have too much prejudice when I pick a subject. And after that, I think uh, it's everybody's uh, story that they can believe in censoring or not. Yeah. Mm. 
Um, so it isn't possible for artists inside of Tibet to create works like uh, the ones that reference self-immolation, because certainly that would draw the attention of the Chinese authorities. So the next CU Denver student question is how do you, along those lines, how do you view the position of an artist as an activist? Do artists have a responsibility to speak out? I, I think if, I think we arrange, we play with forms, that my belief, I think we play with forms, that means, I think if we pay enough attention, um, you naturally have a comment, no? The world out around us is, I mean, it's not something perfect. <laughs> So I think this statement, comments, and that comes into forms, composition, is I think a very natural phenomenon. So, um, um, and then others might say activist or this, whatever, but I think, um, I think to say what you believe, I think it's much more easier than to keep it to yourself and not say it. So I, I think, it's a very natural thing to say what you feel and what you believe. Um, so the next CU Denver student question, uh, so uh, the students read a bit about you, and as you're mentioning now, you try to make work for yourself, mm -hmm. but this student says, all artists communicate with an audience. Who do you see as your primary audience? So even if you're not necessarily making the work for that audience. Yeah, I, I think I have, I personally have one audience, I think, which is, not sounding it very bad, but I, I am this audience, <coughs> I think, that even when the process, while making it, um, there's always this, uh, this critique is there, this person who's looking at. So um, as long as I'm fine with uh, what I wanted to say and what's coming out there, then uh, I think rest would uh, come with their own opinion. So. I don't think, otherwise there'll be seven billion to make them happy, but that's not <laughs> possible, no? So I think if you can, there's less friction between your opinion, your practice, and where you want to go, somehow that arrangement would have some kind of melody that people will come and connect, I think. You, I, yeah. If you go out with the audience, then that's a, I think, I think not to have an audience is good. And then you, I think the audience would, there will be audience. If not, that's fine too. Okay. Like you, you are the audience, I think. Yeah. Um, so sort of switching gears here, you also do video works. And one of the video works that we will have uh, up in the exhibition is titled Mandala Deconstructed. So I'm hoping we can switch over to that video. And I think uh, maybe just watch a few minutes of it with the sound playing. And then we'll get back to some questions about that video. Rigdal just mentioned that he got in trouble for this one, and I mm -hmm. want to hear about why he got in trouble <laughs> for this work. Yeah, actually, um, somebody made a poster saying that this Tibetan artist is uh, dancing on a traditional uh, religious mandala, wh which is not. You can see it's at the center, there's a gun. You know, at that time, you hear lots of gun violence in school, in so I thought it would be nice to create a mandala which things that we don't want in life. Usually you create a mandala where the elements are you wanted as compassion or this. So it's kind of like an anti-mandala where you put um, guns, twin tower, global warming and Olympics in Beijing. Then I requested the 
really elders, uh, they were all born in Tibet to come and dance on it, actually. So that's the uh, performance. But uh, so then later, uh, some got uh, misunderstood. And uh, so, yeah, I think uh, then I got in a little trouble. And <laughs> then I have to, every, before what? even any Tibetan community that I yeah. go, they just surround me and have lots of questions that <laughs> I have to explain. But yeah, it's a. So along those lines, and then we can go back um, to the other slides, but another video that, uh, a video work of yours that was very controversial in the Buddhist community was titled Scripture Noodle. Yeah. Can you tell everyone <coughs> what um, what Scripture Noodle is about? We don't have that one here, but just tell yeah. uh, what you did and why it was controversial. Oh, I was at a residency program, and they asked me to make any work. I was not been able to make much work then, so then made a one video piece where I um, I cut onions, tomatoes, and then Scripture, uh, and then I cooked <coughs> the Scripture. And then I put it in two-go box, and then I eat the scripture. And then that was, yeah, that I got <laughs> big trouble. <laughs> and, but then I didn't do it like, um, I planned it for many months. I, did, I read many books about, because there were tradition in Tibet. I was referencing to this one Tibetan scholar, Yendi Chumbe. Mm -hmm. He was one of this greatest, like Tibetan divin she and a writer, poet, painter, uh, was in India for 12 years doing research and all. And in one of his uh, research with uh, Rahul Shankit Yayan, another scholar from Bengal, they went to Tibet to uh, revive scriptures. And then they found in many of the places that uh, Tibetans were eating scriptures. So his comment was the scriptures were supposed to be read in that uh, he has a book called Tambu Serge Thangma, in which he writes as a diary, like, please, Tibetans, don't eat scripture. Actually, the point is to read it. Or even, like, there were places where they won't open the scripture to them. They would say, no, actually, we'll just put you in a head, but we won't open it. It's, like, too precious. So um, that was kind of a comment to that, too. And um, so there were a few references that, from that references, I made this piece. But um, when you look at it, without much of the context, it's just somebody eating a scripture. And then, uh, yeah, and, and actually, and also they didn't, uh, many of them didn't have the idea of a video performance and any of this. So um, they thought, oh, we found one leaked video of Rigdol eating scripture. Oh. <laughs> or like somebody said, like, and then it went on being like, I'm going, I'm walking on the street, just eating scripture. I, my mom received calls. I made sure like mom, my mom never received any of this controversy. But after like three, four months, her friends started calling her and said, well, I hear that your eldest son is, has gone crazy and walking <laughs> on the streets and on the streets just eating scripture. The image was quite, uh, yeah. So, yeah, and then, and then there were all this, uh, yeah, boycott this. But yeah, all, I think, um, I think misunderstanding is also one really great part of art. It, it, uh, in the end, uh, how much ever harsh, slowly after all the emotion settles, when it gets decolorized, then again it comes into a discussion and debate. And so in the end it was all good. They knew more about Gendi Chumbi. They start, you know, so the whole thing, first it was I hate you, and then slowly it was what is art? And then uh, even actually in the Tibetan parliament, in the exile, they were, for the first time, they talked about art, even though in a very negative way, but I liked it. They were talking <laughs> about this scripture noodle. They were wow. saying, uh, we met last time, this artist was saying he bought soil and then made people walk on it, and he's saying this is art. Now there's this artwork where he's eating the scripture and he's calling his art. Now who's deciding art? And mm. there were cultural department minister, I want you to answer, and then there was like at least Oh, that's great. So, yeah. <laughs> Can you, um, so I want to ask about your current project, which is the Tibetan Road Builders. Can you explain that and say a bit about that project? Yeah, it was right after the soil project where the installation was happened. And then I was taking interview of 
I did take interview of all my relatives, especially the older ones. And my grandfather was alive then, so I was interviewing him. And all of a sudden, he started talking about this road builder. We were building roads. We, and I checked into library and all, and I realized that uh, there really isn't information about how the first exiled Tibetans in 19, uh, uh, mid 1950s to uh, like 60s, how they really started this journey of exile. And there were only about, I think now maybe 12 books, of which only one page is dedicated, or one paragraph, or one statement in news, you know. And um, so I started tracing them, and all these elders were all over the world. So just trace them, and then start taking the interview, the stories. Mm. And it took me like, still not finished, like Lodunla is also helping me, the filmmaker. So I tried to involve all these Tibetan filmmakers to help me take interview and, um, and then I think we have around 150 interviews now. At least the history part, we could ar archive it because they have never told the stories and they haven't even told the stories to their grandchildren and children. And um, I think it, it, it changed my life also. Mm -hmm. Can you explain yeah. some of the hardships? So these were the, the, the building the oh, roads yeah. in India. So yeah. when they first came, they didn't know the language. They didn't know all this, um, no money, nothing. They just came empty-handed, and most of them. And um, thousands in number were dying, and they had lots of psychological problems. They were, uh, the initial ones, 80,000 people were in exile. And somehow, most of the stories that you hear in those 1950s, 60s is what's happening in Tibet. So this whole uh, attention was diverted towards what's happening in Tibet, while equally those in exile were suffering, and their story was not really documented. And within that story, you find there were also a very creative time where all these uh, Tibetans, I call it shovel songs, when they were building the roads, they were the unbelievable songs they've created. And uh, I call it fragments where, when we document, one elders would remember two lines of the song in maybe in Nepal, and the other would remember the other two line in Toronto, and the another would have it in New York. So it's like they're all spread. So we we're collecting this and trying to reconstruct uh, what had happened and how this all began. So. This is about the uh, genesis of what exile and what kind of experience they went through. And, uh, and each individual had so many different way of, uh, the cause is the same, but how they took it and how they expressed it and how they lived it, it was very creative from, and sad, creative, and in the end you can see them, like even when the 90s, 100s, they can forgive them, they can, so it's a very, I thought it was an unbelievable journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is lots of, uh, yeah, and we also had psychiatrists there because mm -hmm. they were falling from chairs. They were, it was, a, even I didn't expect <coughs> when I dig the story, this is going to be the kind of uh, uh, I have to deal with. So. Uh, even that's when I also started a little bit of meditation now because I was also going crazy <laughs> because I didn't expect. Uh, and then it's not like reading a book. It's like this person is right there and it's his story and uh, very powerful, yeah. It uh, completely changed the way I look at what art could do. Yeah. So I have one more question before we'll have um, the audience ask some questions. Um, can you say a bit about the Dialogue Artist Residency? So what is it and why did you want to set up this artist residency? Yeah, I, um, because uh, Tibetans right now in exile, we really don't have an art structure. And also I think, um, um, and as a community also, they haven't explored much about what the definition of art could be. So they have a very limited uh, definition that constrains everyone within it. So I thought it would be nice to have a re residency which is more dedicated on the process. So it's not about 
getting attention, but it's about paying attention. So, so this whole where we call it dialogue artist residency, where we invite uh, um, philosopher, yogi, uh, a scientist, and then a writer, and so have this let their consciousness bounce with one another. And then, so it's more focused on process oriented. And then invite uh, all different artists to have dialogue. And, uh, and right now, probably uh, like 10 artists there, like writers, all these things. And there'll be more artists like uh, from Nepal, India coming. So this is a small, very small residency. It's not like big. In we have, a, yeah, in India, yeah. We have yeah. library, which is very small. Everything is, but at least it's uh, better than not having at all. So we start something very small there. That's yeah. great. It's been like five years, yeah, yeah. And we don't advertise, so it's uh, it's interesting. So somebody complained. I never could find it. I said that's the point. So you really desperately <laughs> want to be here. <laughs> so that's the yeah. That's the idea where. We won't advertise, we won't, so you, sh you should know why you're here. This, this is not about, this is about paying attention, not getting attention, mm -hmm. so yeah. That's great. Um, so if you do have a question, please raise your hand, and I think we have mics. Yes, we do have mics on both sides, great. So please wait to ask your question until you have the mic in your hand so we get it recorded. Um, Um, it is so glad to meet you and being uh, one of uh, Dr. Magnara's students, I think for us it is finally nice to actually listen to the artists that we um, read about in class. Um, so my question um, for you would be, do you envision the creation of a contemporary identity for a contemporary Tibet? through this fusion of personal experience, traditional iconography, and um, a contemporary medium um, to sort of suggest what is happening in contemporary Tibet today. Um, sort of to summarize it would be this contemporary identity that is more than what uh, is circulated in mainstream population today about still about a stereotypical image of what Tibet should be and is. So, do you envision something that is um, different than that? Um, when I look at artworks, most of the time, when I see something different than what I do, I'm always like attracted, like, and. Um, even when I'm making artwork, I think my I try to make sure that this piece is um, next piece is completely different, you know. So it's like uh, so. Then if the, there's an idea of contemporary art, even if it's a now, but still it's a structure, no. So I, I, I my right now process is, is it possible for me to free myself from structure also, or definition or anything? where I'm just responding to an issue and even the methods or why should it be a color from this store or you know so the soil would be equally like a paint tube so um, more interested in uh, uh, what could be something new than uh, what new structure could be so it's like each piece can be like a poetry, and then it's gone. The next will be next. Uh, so I don't have, uh, right now, it seems like uh, lots of artists are interested in identity. But I think identity is like an ice cream. It makes sense at certain temperature. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, so, so uh, if you can, uh, if you can really, uh, as a game, not taking it seriously as identity, like if you're creating an identity today, you break it tomorrow, you break it tomorrow, and next time it's not really about that structure. It is how you play with that structure. So that's where I'm really interested. But I don't do, I don't know this is the answer. <laughs> yeah. 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 Other questions? Great. Thanks. 
Um, kind of along those same lines, um, I'm wondering if you as the artist feel that the process of making an individual piece is almost more important than the finished product. I think somebody once asked, what is art? And you know, question. And I said, when I'm finished, let's say I'm standing next to a finished painting, maybe in response to that, I might have a different set of uh, statement. But then imagine while I'm making it, you ask, what is art? Within that context, then different statement. Then I go back, even I'm not starting interacting with uh, any material, just thinking about what I want to make at that time, if you ask. And then none of this, but just sleeping in bed, <laughs> you know? And at that time, so I think, I think it is just my little prejudice that I think the work is done. For me, I think I'm just trying to make one painting from the very beginning, and when I die, you put them all together, it's one painting, I think. So it, um, um, so I think, that's why I think the process itself, where every minute it's changing, the sentence gets longer and longer, and then maybe it's just too exhausted that we call it finished, otherwise I think you could keep going, no? <laughs> so yeah. But I think in process, there's a lot. I'm beginning to pay more attention to process. I'm asking questions like, what do we mean by creativity? What has attention to do with uh, creativity? Um, what is instinct? All this word we use while uh, talking about art. But what it is really in experience, you know? And a tongue, you know, when you taste it, what is creativity? So these things, I think, come while you are interacting, while the whole thing is happening. I think, yeah, yeah, I think. Like when you're painting, I was noticing when I'm hungry most of the time. Like is it always when painting or after you're done with the painting, you remove back and you start <coughs> looking at it. That's when most of the hunger, I have to drink water, restroom comes, no? But while painting, you are, I think, lost even um, somehow, like maybe the time and all those things, not really out of what show or this, ex none of that exists. It's just you there and trying to give forms to your uh, feeling or attention, you know? So uh, I think that's where I think a lot can explore, you know? If I think process, that's why I'm interested in process. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Um, uh, it's wonderful listening to you and Thank what you have to say. It's just lovely. And um, a couple of two, two pieces. One is more, well, um, the residency in Dharamsala, is there a relationship with Norbalinka? Are, are you involved? And the, uh, it's, that's questions related to another question about, uh, In your studies in contemporary art and theory and philosophy and Derrida and deconstruction and all of this sort of thing, do you, are you thinking at all how those things may relate to traditional Buddhist, Tibetan Buddhist philosophy? Mm, or yeah. And <coughs> what does that look like? Yeah, I think they, uh now even science is also talking about observer-based. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I always, <coughs> when I read, trying to understand Derrida or Nietzsche or especially from existential philosophers, I was actually looking at it like um, somebody talking in a Buddhist term without using any Buddhist word. And um, so, yeah, I always, uh, found it very interesting um, where it is, this is where I think process is, I'm interested, where it's not about what do you see, but it's about who is looking at it. So the process, in the process then it is about uh, uh, where does the attention come, you know, 
when you paying when try to pay attention you know what happens to breath then when you're trying to use it with the, you know movement so um, even in one of the indian term for art is chitrakala chitrakala means uh, the etymologically if you go back chitra comes from chitta it's a consciousness and kala comes as kal means time and kala also means death also means emptiness this is all same word and so there's a, when you weave consciousness uh, with time when you weave something that is uh, according to buddhist philosophy something that is um, beyond the dimension of uh, fixed like permanent or all those things whereas uh, and then when you weave with time this is art so uh, then this talking about again process i think so um, maybe that's why that's how i was interested i don't know <laughs> why but um, yeah i think uh, this is how they might relate yeah. Yeah, because i used all this western idea to say to actually break the pattern you know so never to adopt a pattern if uh, my prejudice is being broken by derrida's theory i use it to break break my prejudice then if it's uh, nietzsche then yeah nietzsche so it's all being taken not to build me but to unbuild me and then when this unbuilding happens maybe is it possible to look at the subject matter uh, then it becomes all about how you experience the while you're making the work so i always ask younger artists even i'm also so we are all young artists so we ask each other but i always say do you really enjoy while you're painting you know how is your breath and and if it's there then uh, if not then why then you know so yeah <laughs> do you think that do you think that uh norbalinka would be interested in in interacting with i mean I, I remember yeah. it being very involved with the traditional yeah yeah nubalinka is more about uh um preserving the culture where they have uh, all traditional tanka schools traditional sculpture and these things and um but the residency that we we were talking about earlier it's all about um uh, what is tradition so it's all about question uh, it's all about innovation over there it's all about preservation so they're both interesting <laughs> but uh without working together as a project but it is always working it is this uh, nubulinga's uh, preservation thing is everybody in everybody every tibetan's had to what to preserve what not to and who decides the identity <laughs> yeah so over there we just experiment mostly so it's uh, most uh, contemporary or Yeah, artist that uh, wants to question tradition. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I think Tenzing Rigdal. I think that's all the time we have. So, a big uh, round of you. applause. Thank you so much. Um, and please, I think are you going to mention the art hotel over there? You got it. Okay. Thank you. So, thank you. so good evening and uh, thank you all for coming this evening. I'm Mandy Vink, the chair of the Contemporary Alliance Board of Directors. And so before we transition to our reception, I have just a few announcements. First of all, again, thank you to Tenzing Rindal and Sarah. Thank you so much for leading such an interesting conversation. And we really look forward to seeing the exhibition open. I also wanted to thank our co-sponsor, UC Denver College of Arts and Media and their 20th anniversary celebration. So this is all part of a lot of exhibition and programming that's going on. So congratulations. And of course, these lectures would not be would not be possible without the generous sponsorship from Vicky and Kent Logan. Uh, so thank you to them as well. <laughs> and uh, I wanted to let you know that uh, the lecture series is one of the many benefits if you are a part of the Contemporary Alliance. So if you have any questions on what it is, feel free to find myself. Um, anybody else that's here this evening that that is looks like they would be willing and interested to answer questions for you. Um, uh, we're gladly to glad to fill you in, but we are a support group of the art museum specifically for the modern contemporary collection and really looking to foster 
relationships, contemporary alliances uh, with local, regional, and national artists and artist conversations. So with that, I wanted to say that we're in the midst of our spring Logan Lecture Series. We have two more coming up just around the corner that tickets are available for. Uh, the next lecture is on March 13th, and that's with Simpiwe Nzube, and then Fred Wilson on April 20th. So keep an eye out for that. And now I want to invite you all to join us for a reception. It's not here in the Art Museum. It's actually across the plaza in the Art Hotel. Um, but yeah, free. And please join us to continue the conversation. Thank you. <laughs>